in a city. Indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. Also, do not take seriously all words which are spoken so that you will not hear your servant cursing you. For you also have realized that you likewise have many times cursed others. I tested all this with wisdom and I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. What has been is remote and exceedingly mysterious. Who can discover it? I directed my mind to know, to investigate, and to seek wisdom and an explanation, and to know the evil of folly and the foolishness of madness. And I discovered more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets, whose hands are chains. One who is pleasing to God will escape from her, but the sinner will be captivated by her. Behold, I have discovered this, says the preacher, adding one thing to another to find an explanation, which I am still seeking but have not found. I have found one man among a thousand, but I have not found a woman among all these. Behold, I have found only this, that God made men upright, but they have sought out many devices. This is an interesting section in Ecclesiastes. I bring you back to chapter 7, and we will finish looking at this chapter this morning. <clears throat> there are some interesting thoughts that come, and it seems rather strange the, the way that Solomon just piles up these statements through the end of this chapter, but they're all related in some way. And as I came to this section of Ecclesiastes, I was thinking about Blaise Pascal, and he is, was a genius. It's interesting, during his time, there were many scientific discoveries, and many of them were by him. He was a child prodigy, amazing mind. He developed what we consider, what we call the anthropological argument. And this was his defense against skeptics and the reasoning for the existence of God. And the anthropological argument comes from the Greek word anthropos, which means man. And basically, he looked at man and his state or his condition and reason from them the reality of God and the need for salvation. But he said this in arguing, he says, The Christian doctrines of creation and the fall best explain the paradoxes of the human condition and render Christianity worthy of respect. He understood some powerful truths in regards to the, the condition of mankind. And as I thought about it and I thought about this passage... I was thinking about the, the ability for us to be able to deal with a human condition in a very psychologized and very individualistic culture that we live in today. The Word of God is necessary for us. And understanding the human condition from the Word of God is vitally important. We live in a world in where people are self-diagnosing themselves, where you can get an app now where you can type in your if you will, your symptoms are speaking your symptoms and you get a diagnosis and you can even self-medicate. And we have all these commercials about all of these things that you can take to help out whatever problem it is that you are facing. We live in a world that's so individualistic that we find people who talk about things that they experience that no one has ever experienced before. I had a believer explaining to me about his wife, something that she was going through and he was suggesting to me that no one has ever dealt with this under the sun. That no one has ever gone through what she is going through. And the problem with that is that you finally, you back yourself into a corner in that if you say that there is no one who's ever faced this ever since the beginning of time, and no one's ever gone through this, then what you're saying is that this is so unique that even God didn't know that it would exist, and nor did He even give you a solution within Scripture. But that's not so. But that's ultimately what he was leading to. And I asked him, do you realize what you're suggesting? And do you realize that when you say such things like this, you even call into question the character of God himself? That somehow God isn't sufficient or the word of God isn't sufficient. Pascal went on to say, he said, man's greatness and wretchedness are so evident that the true religion must necessarily teach us that there is a man some great principle of greatness and some great principle of wickedness. He said, humans are a curious mixture of widely divergent, 
properties. He made this declaration, what sort of freak then is man? How novel, how monstrous, how chaotic, how, how paradoxical, how prodigious. Judge of all things, but feeble earthworm. Repository of truth, sink of doubt and error. He is the glory and he is the refuse of the universe. This isn't just Pascal's view, this is the view of the Word of God. And he wasn't just merely putting these unharmonious juxtapositions about human life up against each other, and he didn't merely assume the fallenness of man, but he understood the flawed condition that it came from something else. As Solomon reflects in verse 29, Behold, I have found only this, that God made man upright, but they have sought only many devices. In other words, schemes to get out of contrivances to overcome that which is expected. Pascal, it's interesting because he lived in a time when there was great focus upon reason and intellect, and he didn't deny that, that this is what set man, sets man apart from the rest of the creatures, is that we have reason and we have intellect, but at the same time he understood that there was a hindrance. He understood that we were severely restricted when it came to our reasoning and our thinking. He understood what many of his contemporaries didn't understand, is that we are contaminated by sin. We are corrupted man. Two things we sang in that song as we ended, right? Two things I must confess. My worthiness and my unworthiness. And this Pascal understood, this Solomon understands, he realizes the fact that we have all our capacities, but we are defaced and we are corrupted by sin. So Solomon is going to take us in a journey, verses 19 and following, and he is going to take us face to face with the world. He has been dealing with the issue of suffering and sin in chapter 7 into chapter 8, verse 1. And it made me think of Jeremiah's complaint in Jeremiah chapter 12 found this very intriguing, and this is Jeremiah's interaction with God, and, and Solomon has the same reflection in verses 15 through 18 of chapter 7. But Jeremiah had this observation, he says, You are always righteous, Lord, when I bring a case before you. Yet I would speak with you about your justice. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? And why do all the faithless live at ease? You ever ask these questions of God? Why in your justice do these things happen? Jeremiah says, you have planted them and, you have, and they have taken root. They grow and they bear fruit and you, have always, you are always on their lips but far from their hearts. So here's Jeremiah's solution to the problem. He says, you know me, Lord. You see me and you test my thoughts about you. Drag them off like sheep to be butchered and set them apart for the day of slaughter. Make them into lamb chops. Get rid of them. Destroy them. I find this interesting. Because here's God's response to it in verse 5. God's answer to Jeremiah is this. If you have raced with men on foot and they have worn you out, how can you compete with horses? If you stumble in safe country, how will you manage in the thickets by the Jordan? If you can't run in the safe country, how are you going to run when it gets really difficult? I mean, what you're expecting and really what Jeremiah is hoping is that God comes alongside of him and says, Hey, Jeremiah, good try, buddy. Here's a badge for participation. No. God says, look, if you can't even do it when it's good, how are you going to do it when it's really bad? And it's not really bad yet. Here's the amazing thing about God. Two million and two reasons why God is so amazing and wonderful to me. Is God doesn't tell me what I want to hear he tells me what I need to hear. It's funny because Robert brings up Hebrews 12, and I was thinking about Hebrews 12 in light of this this morning, and I was thinking about in Hebrews 12, talking about the resistance against our sin as we struggle the war against sin in our life. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4, he says this, You haven't even struggled to the point of shedding your own blood in your struggle against sin i.e. the Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, but thy will be done. 
Right? How many times have I acted like somehow I've resisted evil in my life and I have resisted sin in my life and I have striven to do the will of God in every circumstance? How often have I thought that I have resisted to the point like I couldn't give in? I just, I have to give in. God, I've tried everything. I've done my best. And God says to me, you haven't even broken a sweat yet. Let alone shed your own blood trying to resist sin in your life. God doesn't tell me what I want to hear. He tells me what I need to hear. And here we find Solomon doing this, and he is going to talk about the issue of living life in the long haul, not shortcuts. In chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, he talks about the potential instructiveness that comes with suffering, which we've seen before, that inner character is more crucial than outer fragrance. The potential dangers in times of suffering he covered in verses 7 through 10, that there are obstacles to wisdom. There is the danger of corruption. There is the danger of impatience. There is the warning of short-lived highlights and the warning of shortcutting the process. In other words, he says in verse 8 that the time of testing has an end product. There is a reason why God is taking you through difficult times. He's going to produce something in your life of great profit. There is a danger, he says in chapter, uh, chapter 7, verse 9, of bitterness. He says, in the bosom, this is the innermost part. If tolerated resentment makes its home within you, it makes a home within your personality. And he highlights this by the structure of this verse as he lays out for us the danger of anger and bitterness as it makes its place in our life and in our personality becomes a part of us. It is that thing that rots us from the inside out. He also goes on in verse 10 of chapter 7 to talk about the danger of nostalgia, that there is no future in living in the past. So now he leads us into the need for wisdom, verses 19 and following. Wisdom strengthens a wise man more than ten rulers who are in a city. It's interesting because Solomon started this second section of chapter 7 with the reflection of the fact that he is a man who has seen everything, verse 15. I've seen it all. The challenge is to listen to a man who's gone through a lot in life. He's experienced everything, women, wealth, the world. He's basically seen everything, experienced pretty much everything that you can possibly think to experience in life. This is his end dwelling as he talks about men and women in the end of this chapter. Remember what ensnared him. God warned the nation of Israel and he warned the men, do not marry a woman who is a foreigner. In other words, don't marry a woman outside the covenant community. Why? Because she will lead you astray. You will begin to worship her gods, her false gods. And this is the warning. Solomon didn't heed that, found himself ensnared. And this is what he reflects on verse 26. I discovered more than death a woman in whose heart are snares and nets and whose hands are chains. He's seen this thing, these things, he's seen everything, and so therefore he is going to take us on this journey of things that he has observed as he continues through the rest of this section of Ecclesiastes. And it's interesting because this is the 11th time that he uses this phrase and the point is to remind us that as we read through Ecclesiastes that this is an examination of life under the sun, of everything that you could experience. And what I find intriguing is he walks into the section that he's going to exhort us towards wisdom and that it is something that is beneficial to our life. He talks about the brevity of his life. He mentions his lifetime of futility, or literally in the days of my futility, or in my fleeting days. Over and over, he brings us to this reality, the fact that life is short. It is a vapor. It is here today, gone tomorrow. It's like Psalm 90, and in Psalm 78, there is that warning, the futility of life. And in Psalm 90, the psalmist writes, Moses, and he says, Help me to number my days so that I might offer up you a wise heart. Help me to see how brief life is. Help me to see that it is vapid. Help me to understand, as Paul exhorts us in Colossians and Ephesians, that we must redeem the time, for the days are evil. Buy up every moment of your life, not to just have experiences of this life, but to do things that serve God. To do things that bring Him honor and glory. To do things to prepare us for eternity. Or as Moses writes in Psalm 90, establish the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Enable us to do things that last. To do things that are eternal in this life that is so vapid and so fleeting. Twice he's going to return to this in the chapters that that follow. 
in chapter 9, he's going to talk about the days of our fleeting life. And so over and over, he's going to remind us of the fact that we are finite. This hope leads into his argument in regards to the issue of wisdom in our life. That we are finite creatures, but also that we are sinners. Verse 20, indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. These are two things that hinder us from understanding. These are two things that hinder us in life. One is that we are finite beings, and the other thing is that we are sinful. And we need to understand this. And the solution that comes, right? We know the Savior, Jesus Christ. As Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, he said, These sacred writings are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Solomon says wisdom is crucial. And so therefore it is appropriate for him to address it again in his letter. And if I could give you this definition of wisdom, and I think it's an intriguing thought by Swindoll, he says a wisdom is the God-given ability to see life with rare objectivity and to handle life with rare stability. To be able to objectify yourself and to stand outside of yourself. And Solomon is going to draw on this reality. Notice in verse 21 and 22. Also do not make seri take seriously the words which are spoken, so that you will not hear your servant cursing you. Why? For you also have realized that you likewise have many times cursed others. In other words, you've done the same thing. <laughs> So knowing your own sinfulness will enable you to shrug off other people's sinfulness against you. In other words, the ability to see ourselves for who we are. This is what wisdom helps us to do. It enables us to, to have this objectivity to look at ourselves, but it also gives us a rare stability in life. And thus, verse 19, wisdom strengthens the wise man. He says, wisdom is greater than the collective opinions. We've seen a lot of foolishness displayed in the last several years, haven't we? A lot of foolishness. And we have been in need of great wisdom from God as we dealt with the situations we have dealt with and as we continue to walk forward. But notice Solomon's illustration. He wants us to understand the value of wisdom and he compares an individual's benefits of wisdom to the experiences of those who are rulers who take care of the citizens of a particular city. As Eaton reflects on this, he says, The illustration teaches us that wisdom in the fear of God may be greater than the collective ability of a group of experienced leaders. That the given insight by God can enable us to see things that even ten who are experienced cannot see. We need this insight from God to see life for what it is to see us for who we are, to see others for who they are. This is what Pascal was getting at. For us to be able to deal and find the answers in life, to develop a worldview and a life view, you need to understand the human condition. That we are corrupted through and through. That we can't even trust ourselves. Even if we're wise and even if we're righteous, we still can't lean on our own wisdom and righteousness. And even when we receive wisdom from God, we still need God. <laughs> Sometimes we get the thought that if I have the revelation from God and His Word, then if I need this and I go to this and I have this, then somehow I really don't need to lean on God anymore. I just lean on this. But I even need God and how to apply this to life. Sometimes we think that the more that we know, the less that we need to depend on God. Solomon says, I need him for wisdom, but I also need him to apply that wisdom. This is going to set us up for chapter 9, verses 13 through 16, and he's going to have a similar thought as he expounds on this observation he makes here in chapter 7 and chapter 9 of verse 13 and following he says this also this I came to see as wisdom under the sun and it impressed me there was a small city with few men in it and a great king came to it surrounded it and constructed large siege works against it it was going to take it over but there was found in it a poor wise man and he delivered the city by his wisdom so I said wisdom is better than strength You can go up against great, great armies when you have the insight of God, can you not? 
Look at how many godly men and godly women face the world and the things of the world with the wisdom of God. The enablement that he can provide for us. But Solomon is going to remind us that only God and God alone is all wise. No matter if we are wise as Solomon was wise, we will never be all wise. Because we can never be God. This is the reminder then as he walks through these verses that follow. Wisdom needed in light of human sinfulness, verses 20 through 22. Wisdom gives us insight. It is a part of the strengthening ability. And I know that I quote old dead guys, but hey, I read a lot of old dead guys. And I think it's good. We stand on the shoulders of others. G.K. Chesterton, he was a philosopher and theologian. He was once asked, what do you think of civilization? He answered and said, I think it's a great idea. Why doesn't somebody start one? He understood the sinfulness of man and the sinfulness of this world. Later on, seeing a series of articles entitled, What's Wrong with the World? Chesterton sent a short letter to the editor. And he said, Dear Sir, regarding your articles, What's Wrong with the World? He said, I am. Yours truly, G.K. Chesterton. Why? He understood we're all guilty before God. There is not one of us who is not corrupt. We may be able to reason. We may be a genius like Pascal, but yet he even understood the frailty of our reasoning and intellect because we're sinners. We can't rely upon ourselves. Psalm 14, 3 says this, They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. I know we all say that we believe this, but it's interesting sometimes when I listen to believers speak about other people or even about their own life that when you really listen to their words, what creeps out is this thought that really in the back of their minds, they truly think that man is still good. And that somehow we deserve happiness and pleasantness in our life. That somehow we aren't worthy of God's condemnation. Even the wise righteous manifest the effects of the fallen nature. We all commit sins of commission, right? But we also have sins of omission. There are things that we know that we do, but what about the things that we don't do? This struck me one time, first time, years and years ago, I was reading J.C. Ryle's book on holiness. And he talks about the issue of, right, the sin of commission, the sins of omission. And it was like, all of a sudden, this light bulb turned on in my head and my heart. And I'm like, whoa, hello. I think about telling lies, don't do that, right? Don't steal, don't cheat, right? But what about the things that I withhold? In other words, I, I can have bitterness in my heart towards someone but I can also fail to show them the love that I'm supposed to show them. Well, I didn't think, do anything horrible to this person or say anything about them, but did you show them kindness and compassion? Did I withhold something from them that I was supposed to manifest to them? Romans 13, love is a debt that we will never repay to our fellow man. Never repay. We always think about the things that we do, but what about the things that we don't do? No one can claim to be free from sin during this life of under the sun. He understood, Solomon did, that flaw of the human character prevents anyone from being able to depend on their own wisdom or their own righteousness. Even when we receive these things from God, we still need God to manifest them. Sin is universal, verse 20. It is also inward. He's going to deal with in chapter 9, verse 3, that we are full of evil. The sinful nature shows itself in specific acts. We've seen him talk about the oppression of the poor, envy, greed, insensitivity, and worship, pride, anger. Struggle with any of these this week? Have any of these things in your life that you need to deal with? What about withholding kind words from someone that needs them? Because we just have... No time to stop and do this. I've got things to do. I've got a schedule to keep. I've got things that I've got to take care of for work and house and whatever else. What about our talk? 
the way that we use our mouths. It's interesting, I was talking to one of my sons this last week, and we were talking about gossip. He said, Dad, you know, I realize that gossip isn't just about the person who does the talking. He said, I realize that gossip has to do with the person also who's listening. He says, when someone comes up to me to gossip about somebody else, I need to tell them I'm not listening to you. That's what Solomon's going to deal with here. Wisdom and earplugs. Spurgeon told his students, he says, you ought to keep one blind eye and one deaf ear. Makes an interesting way of walking through life, doesn't it? He said, you cannot stop people's tongues, and therefore the best thing to do is to stop your own ears and never mind what is spoken. Sometimes you need to do this, right? This is Solomon's warning. Don't take to heart these things, otherwise you might hear your servant cursing you. But just remember, there are plenty of people you've cursed yourself. We start pointing our finger at other people and the things that they do, call them out for the sin in their own life, but we're not willing to acknowledge the sin in our life. Twice, it's interesting, I was so staggered. Two young women dealing with just horrible situations in their marriage. Would have never thought that they would go through this, knowing their husbands, both of them and the wives. Started off with what seemingly to be very godly couples in church. One of them I married. Both the husbands got messed up in things. And it's amazing to me, and I still reflect on how these two women responded to the sin in their husbands' lives. They both said, without knowing, and they know each other, but neither of them talked to each other as they faced this, but it was interesting, but both of them responded with, I had to step back and look at myself and realize that I am also a sinner. And therefore I realized that I needed to offer them forgiveness. <laughs> What's like, Wow. Because I guarantee you the things that their husbands did, many would have said, leave them. Divorce them. You have every right to do this. Yet they stayed with them. They worked through this. But what enabled them to do that was to realize their own sinfulness before God. I was stunned. <laughs> I'm still blown away by that. That's the wisdom of God in someone's life. That's that objectivity to be able to step back and to see yourself before God and to acknowledge who you really are. And so Solomon says, wisdom, it helps us to bear up under the criticisms because we know that we also criticize. In other words, the individual who is acutely aware of their own sinfulness will readily shrug off the foolishness remarks of other people. How quick we are to criticize and judge. How slow we are to forgive and show mercy. And it's interesting that we have a tendency to keep a list of wrongs suffered, don't we? Wisdom guards us, he said, in the early parts of this chapter. It guards us from extremes. Wisdom gives us stability and it gives us insight in clearing our minds. It is the source of strength and this strength is enabling us to walk and, and to seek God's forgiveness when we sin. The understanding of limitations. This leads Solomon in chapter 7 verses 23 through 24. I tested all of this with wisdom and I said I will be wise but it is far from me. What has been remote is exceedingly mysterious. Who can discover it? I directed my mind to know, to investigate, to seek wisdom and an explanation, and to know the evil of folly and the foolishness of madness. I'm going to combine these two things together, the understanding of limitations and limitations of mankind. Solomon realized his own limitations. Only God is all wise. No matter how much we increase in our wisdom and our knowledge of the Word of God and understand the principles that are there, we will never be God. We will never be all wise. No human being possesses the capacity to fully understand God's plan or program. And he understood this. I looked for explanations. And I couldn't find an answer to everything. 
Why do you walk out of the hotel one morning and the car's gone? Someone stole it. Why? Did God do that just so I'd go buy a new car? Right? Why couldn't you just tell me, buy a new car? I would have done that. Why do I have to go through these things? We have these questions in life, do we not? Things happen, we want to know. And Solomon says, I look for explanations. And I couldn't find explanations for everything. In other words, this wise man knows that he does not know. And this is what helps him to become wise. Or to put it this way, knowing that he cannot know what he cannot know indicates that he truly knows. Do you understand your shortcomings? I realize there are so many things that I cannot answer in life, but one thing I do know that God is in control. He is the controller of seasons. Even though I can't see what He's doing in the moment, I know He's working in the moment. And most often I have found in my life that when I see God less, that's usually when He's more at work. So another area of strength that wisdom gives is accepting the fact that we cannot grasp everything that God is doing in this world. Man is a rational creature. We can evaluate, he says, right? We can investigate, we can observe, we can reflect, we can draw conclusions, but we are finite, sinful through and through. We cannot know and understand everything. Reason and intellect are corrupt, as Pascal reflected. We may not fully understand all that God is doing, but we have enough wisdom to live for the good of others and the glory of God. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, we just need to keep walking. Just keep walking. He concludes with this observation about the human race. The race was not created neutral but upright. And despite this original righteousness, sin has come in. And it is perverse. It is deliberate. And it is universal. This is God's diagnosis of man. Understanding human condition will help us in dealing with others. It will help us in leading them to Christ. We have a solution. But sometimes they need to understand what their true condition is. They need to understand that there's nothing new under the sun. Whatever you're struggling with, others have gone through this. Yeah, there are unique things that you might learn from God, but they aren't things that no one else has learned. There is nothing new under the sun. So Solomon is going to end with this question in chapter 8, verse 1. Who is like the wise man and who knows the interpretation of a matter? <laughs> Robert, would you close in a word of prayer?